welcome everyone to Book a Lunchtime for week five of Michaelmas Term. For regulars, those of you who uh, are come every now and then, you will not need the next little bit of information. But for those who are new to Book at Lunchtime, um, I wanted to say that it's one of our longest standing flagship events here in Torch. The podcasts and videos of our previous discussions are a popular feature of the website um, and the YouTube channel. And we've been privileged to feature an astonishing range of authors uh, over the years. Please do visit the YouTube channel uh, to see more. And because of the YouTube channel, that's why we have some cameras at the back of the room. We do have one more book at lunchtime planned for this term in week seven, which will be featured on the website and in the next uh, newsletter. And it's a um, fascinating book, Paris and the Parasite by Max Smith, um, partly about graffiti in Paris, um, but also about the whole idea of the sort of city as, as, a, as a beast that has parasites and hosts and other things on it. Um, as I've said, visit our website, um, both to see past uh, events um, in this series and also to see more about other upcoming events across the torch uh, spectrum of things that we do. Today, we're delighted to welcome Professor Caroline Larrington, and we'll be discussing her book, as you know, All Men Must Die. Caroline is Professor of Medieval uh, European Literature here at Oxford and is joined on the discussion panel by Dr. Laura Varnum, lecturer in Old and Middle English at University College here in Oxford, and Dr. Kate Olley, V.H. Galbraith, Junior Research Fellow in Medieval Studies at St. Hilda's College. I'm about to disappear from this podium, and the All Men Must Die injunction will then be <laughs> replaced. Um, by the three women who will discuss this book. Um, as Caroline writes in the preface to All Men Must Die, she's often asked why she wrote Winter is Coming, her previous book on Game of Thrones, also available here. And I'm going to quote you. The respectable answer for an academic is, of course, to suggest that Game of Thrones operates as a kind of gateway drug to medieval history, literature and culture. Fans who are drawn to its extraordinary world can be induced to try the harder stuff. Beowulf, Mongol history, Byzantine chronicles, or Old Norse mythology. I am not only a medievalist, she says. I am also a scholar of medievalism, intensely interested in the very different ways in which the medieval is deployed in contemporary culture. End of quotation. Now, talking about the deployment of contemporary culture, we don't have an iron throne for Caroline to sit on today, but there is a photo of her seated on it in page 78 of All Men Must Die, if people want to see that. We are, more seriously, looking forward to a great discussion today, and I'll now hand over to our chair for the discussion, Dr. Laura Varnum. A few words about Laura before I start. Laura is lecturer in Old and Middle English Literature at University College, Oxford. She's the author of The Church as Sacred Space in Middle English Literature and Culture, 2018, and the co-editor of Encountering the Book of Marjorie Kemp, 2021. She's also currently interested in medievalism, in other words, the way in which the medieval is understood uh, in contemporary culture and across time. And in both critical and practical forms, she's working on feminist poetry collection inspired by the women of the old English epic Beowulf. As I say, I will leave the stage, leave this to the women, and to the question, uh, I'm sure one of the questions that will come up precisely is women's agency within uh, this kind of work. Um, over to you to chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Wes. Um, I'm really delighted to be uh, chairing uh, this uh, panel discussion uh, of Caroline's uh, latest book, All Men Must Die, Power and Passion in Game of Thrones. Um, so I'll just uh, introduce Caroline in a little bit more detail um, and my uh, co-panelist um, before I turn over to uh, Caroline to read from the book. Um, so Caroline Larrington is Professor of Medieval European Literature at Oxford and a Fellow of St John's College. She's written numerous books on medieval literature, including a monograph on brothers and sisters, um, which has some interesting uh, kind of connections for thinking about brothers and sisters in uh, Game of Thrones. 
um, and a number of edited collections um, of essays on emotions in Arthurian literature, um, a handbook to edit poetry, um, and just out this summer, um, Memory and Medievalism in George R. R. Martin and Game of Thrones. Um, she's written widely uh, on medievalism, um, including her book, The Land of the Green Man, A Journey Through the Supernatural Landscapes of the British Isles. Um, and her first book, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, Winter is Coming. Um, she wrote the introduction to a new collection of rewritten folk tales for Virago called Hag. Um, she's worked with artists and writers on the Modern Fairies project. And her next book, just very, very fresh off the press, which will be out uh, from Thames and Hudson uh, in March, is Norse Myths That Shape the Way We Think. Uh, my uh, co-panellist, Dr. Catherine Olley, um, is the VH Galbraith Junior Research Fellow in Medieval Studies at St Hilda's. Her research interests include kinship, childbirth, the body and emotions. Her first monograph, Kinship in Old Norse Myth and Legend, was published by Boyd Allen Brewer uh, just this summer. Um, and she's currently working on a second book, Childbirth in Old Norse Literature, which explores the depiction and cultural significance of childbirth um, in medieval Iceland. Uh, so that's us. Uh, and without further ado, um, Caroline, if you'd like to um, read from the book. Right. Thank you very much for the introduction, Laura. I'm going to start from the afterword. So this is telling you um, things that uh, I hope are not... I'm assuming that nobody here is, is um, going to be upset if there are spoilers in this discussion. Um, but the afterword, I think, sums up quite quite nicely, if that's not too immodest a thing to say, where I felt we got to by the end of the show. And it was, in a way, a kind of epitaph on the world of Game of Thrones. Though, of course, at that stage, it wasn't all that clear that House of the Dragon would be such a huge success as it has been. The show both promised and delivered much that was innovative. It had huge boldness of imagination an approach to storytelling that, by and large, trusted its viewers to keep up without endless recaps. And it offered some radical premises with regard to its cripples, bastards and broken things, and its women. It deployed the freedom provided by its broadcast on HBO in order to show sex, nudity and violence, quite often sexual violence and casual nudity in ways that were as disturbing as they were titillating, often foregrounding the trauma and horror associated with this material. And although some objected or stopped watching to the extent that think pieces entitled Why I'm No Longer Watching Game of Thrones became a distinctive media trope, the show nevertheless did not amass its record-breaking viewing figures without appealing to a significant female audience or to viewers that ranged in age from teenagers to seniors. The millions who watched the show in those 207 different countries all found things in it that spoke to them. Game of Thrones anatomized and critiqued the concept of power and its practice in politics, its official institutions and its unofficial back channels. Yet any promise of a truly progressive vision founded on the limitations of the possible. As Stephanie Gentz observes, as early as the end of season five, quote, the series practice of making visible for visibility's sake is not related to a larger politics of opposition and thus is in danger of wilting into self-congratulatory introspection. At a symposium I attended in Koszalin in Poland in 2016, and I should add that the latest book there is a collection of papers from that symposium. Uh, towards the end of this, the keynote speakers were each assigned a major contender for the Iron Throne. And in a kind of balloon debate, we had to argue the case for their man or woman to seize rule over the Seven Kingdoms. And I was given Gendry, who at that point was still rowing gamely out on the narrow sea, somewhere in the vicinity of Dragonstone. I argued that far from accepting the throne, he would in fact storm back into King's Landing and lead a proletarian revolution that did away with the monarchy entirely. He would liberate the wealth of the noble houses for distribution among the poor and build on the inclusive vision of the High Sparrow, shorn of its religious intolerance and puritanism. This would have been a more liberal version of Dan Hassler Forrest's hopeful conclusion, which I quote, 
A politically desirable ending would be to stay true to the franchise's winter is coming mantra and would see all of Westeros fall to the monstrous others from behind the wall. After which, with any luck, the peasants string up all the aristocrats and collectivise agriculture and establish the socialist utopia. I would have quite liked to have seen that, I think. But alas, my pitch didn't carry the day in the balloon debate, though it did find some support and the throne was duly awarded to Daenerys. Hmm. As it happened, Gendry turned out to be more conformist and romantic than I proposed. He was easily bought off with the title of the Lord of Dragonstone, a recognition that emboldened him to propose marriage to Arya. The Seven Kingdoms were not ready for democratic government, as Sam discovered at the Great Council. The oligarchic city-states of Essos were left to refine and develop their, merchant, their version of merchant capitalism, while the wholesale dismantling of the white saviour slash messiah trope across both Essos and Westeros consigned the revolution of Slaver's Bay to a highly uncertain future. The East was abandoned to fend for itself, the West retrenched, understandably perhaps, given the appalling destruction visited on its major city. And the Six Kingdoms seem now to be deploying a strategy that chimes with the contemporary slogan of America First, though they will be reliant on foreign investment to rebuild. If its politics in the end was not as radical as might have been hoped, Game of Thrones nevertheless attacked some central pieties of Western, in particular American culture. The family, the institution that fundamentally holds society together at a micro level, was, as it's traditional in epic and romance, left behind as the main protagonists set out on their individual quests. Yet, very unusually, no new families are formed by the end of the narrative. The truism that there is no place like home that drives Daenerys' longing for a Westeros she scarcely remembers, and which calls the Stark siblings back to Winterfell, is destroyed, much like King's Landing, as the Stark survivors head out to colonise new spaces. Parents and siblings are dead. The effective ties of family are loosened and shattered, leaving friendship as the most important emotional bond, at least for the men. Women may have assumed power, but their positions leave them isolated and wary of intimacy with the kinds of men who surround them. The sacred cow of the family ends up then on the butcher's block. Rugged, frontier-style individualism is romanticised and celebrated. John heads northwards with Tormund and the free folk, his duty no longer yoked to a crumbling wall. Defence against the now-vanished threat. And Arya sails westward, the stock banner rippling overhead and with her men serving under her command. Their destinies lie in their own hands, framed in space that lies completely outside the social structures of Westeros, a society which had both constrained and damaged them. And I'll stop there, I think. Thank you very much, um, Caroline. Um, I'm an enormous fan of Game of Thrones, so I was thrilled uh, when Caroline's first book came out um, and particularly uh, when the second book came out. Um, one of the uh, moments that you um, mention elsewhere in the in the afterword is Tyrion's uh, speech when they're uh, trying to decide who is going to be uh, the ruler of uh, of Westeros now that uh, Danny is very much out of the picture. And he recommends Bran, um, and he says there's nothing uh, in the world more powerful than a good story, and Bran has the best story um, of all, according to Tyrion. Mm. Um, and Game of Thrones is a really fantastic story, um, and now of course it's one that. Has has a completed narrative arc, at least um, within the series, if, if not within the books. Um, I think one of the, the strengths of Caroline's new book um, is the way that she brings um, literary analysis to bear upon the whole um, series, the whole story arc, um, to think about some of the, the key issues that are at play within all of the, the shows. Um, so there's examinations of characters' identity formations within um, key institutions, um, the ones you just mentioned, the family, um, the great houses, 
Um, she's explored key themes such as power and knowledge, the role of the gods and the supernatural in the show, um, and exploring these questions that Game of Thrones raises about medievalist fantasy epic in the 21st century as a place for thinking about really important topics such as gender, race, sexuality, disability, and violence. Um, and this is particularly important given um, the show's popularity um, and uh, its female audience and the transmedia appeal um, that it has. Um, in um, Winter is Coming, um, Caroline's first book um, on the series that's subtitled The Medieval World of Game of Thrones. Um, the book explores how George R. R. Martin's um, world building is rooted in and reimagines and to some extent critiques um, the Middle Ages of Europe and Asia. Um, and that's a Middle Ages that is in part a reaction to the nostalgic um, and myth-making medievalism of Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings, uh, for example. Um, but it's also a kind of uh, Middle Ages of the modern day. Um, and it a, it's a, um, becomes a way of thinking about the now. When we're thinking about the Middle Ages, um, we're also thinking about the now. Um, Game of Thrones is not just a kind of um, escapist fantasy. And if we think about the, the various symbols from the show um, that have resonated in popular culture, um, the idea of the wall, for example, um, the Berlin Wall had just fallen when George R.R. Martin started writing the books. We'll see more recent resonances of the idea of the wall, um, Trump and so on. Um, the representation of refugees um, within the series um, and the sort of general cultural influence that the series has, um, those kinds of headlines about um, the re you know, this is the real Game of Thrones, uh, thinking about um, political leadership elections and those kinds of questions. It has a real uh, kind of cultural, pur cultural purchase um, in the modern world. Um, but the final two uh, series um, of the show, if you've watched all the way through uh, to, to series eight, um, they go off book um, because we haven't had a new George R. R. Martin Game of Thrones book um, since Dance of Dragons in 2011. Um, so one of the things I think is um, brilliant in, in Caroline's book is the way that it traces the consequences of the shift in the show, um, where the showrunners um, have got to sort of race to wrap up uh, the narrative, um, but without the deep um, uh, sort of medieval background um, that the previous books um, have provided. And we get the shift to a more sort of Hollywood style focus on individual characters' journeys. Um, and that's something we might, we might talk about a little bit later. Um, what I found especially valuable in the book was unpicking um, how Daenerys transforms into the kind of mad dragon queen at the end, um, burning King's Landing to a crisp, uh, being killed off by Jon Snow for the good of the world. Um, and when I first watched season eight, I was really disappointed. I didn't want that to be her end. Um, but when I when I read your book, Caroline, I, I could absolutely see how the seeds had been shown uh, for Daenerys' sort of collapse into kind of madness and paranoia and and, and tyranny um you know that was that was there from earlier on um and i and i do also think it's quite interesting that uh her dragon drogon instead of taking revenge on Jon snow for murdering daenerys melts the iron throne so i think maybe something we might talk about later is if the iron throne is melted what is le what is left at the end of this series what is the to to kind of fight over or fight for um, All Men Must Die also really powerfully examines the structures and themes um, that Caroline's just, just read from the afterword um, that the show really puts under pressure and in some cases dismantles and sacrifices. Um, so uh, romantic, particularly heteronormative love and desire um, and uh, the family um, and the traditional um, ending for, for epic we often end in in marriage. The series is really famous for its multiplication of character perspectives and identities, um, the so-called cripples, bastards and broken things, also the women and the non-white characters. Um, but in my, in my sort of feeling is the show doesn't always live up to its ambitions uh, when it comes to inclusivity um, and diversity. So Yara Greyjoy's queer identity, for example, seems to be kind of male portrayal of what a lesbian might be like. Um, Miss Sande is, is brutally killed off in, the fi in, in one of the final episodes. Bran becomes the three-eyed raven, but it seems as though he's, he's going to leave the day-to-day -day business of kingship uh, to his council. He's not uh, going to be a bit like Robert Baratheon in, in that sense. Um, and he seems to have sort of retreated from any kind of world of human emotion um, altogether. And Caroline uh, says all sorts of interesting things about the ways in which emotions fuel uh, characters' stories in the series. 
Um, and while Sansa uh, is ruling an independent north, which I really like, hurrah for the north, um, Arya leaves Westeros altogether to continue her journey and go out beyond the known world. Um, so before I hand over to Kate, I just wanted to read a couple of sentences from the um, final uh, paragraph in the um, section on gender and marginalisation, um, which I think might give us some things to, to talk about later. Um, and Caroline writes that the, the possibilities for a more progressive and inclusive kind of epic fantasy, one in which one non-white protagonists could share in the distribution of heroic roles, were cast aside after the opening seasons. Even if the white saviour fantasy ends up thoroughly debunked, its toxicity only seems really to matter when white people's lives are at stake. Subaltern voices are suppressed. Grey Worm can only express himself in a broken version of the common tongue, and Miss Sande generally holds her counsel. The subject position of the Eastern others is never heard. Um, and this is particularly in contrast, as Caroline says, to the white figures of Tormund and Egret, who get the chance to offer some radical and oppositional views of the show's dominant ideologies. Along with real starring opportunities for actors of colour, the show seemed in its early seasons to promise innovation and inclusivity within the epic fantasy genre. Uh, but, but perhaps by the end, some of these ambitions uh, have been lost along the way. Um, so, Kate, I'll hand, hand, hand over to you to, to respond. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, so I, I, there's a couple of things in there that I think I want to pick up on. Um, first, what you said about the shift to a more Hollywood style of, of storytelling that Caroline identifies. And, and I found that really revealing um, as well. It really clarified for me why I found some of those later seasons less satisfying because of this shift from the, the sociological to the psychological um, in terms of storytelling that Caroline following Tufeki identifies into the introduction. And so I think there were, there were various decisions in the later to seasons that I found quite jarring. Um, the return of Benjamin Stark, just without any other explanation, just to give him a personal kind of send off an arc. And also why nobody could die in the battle for the dawn, unless it really suited their personal character arc to do so. So Theon and Jorah, you know, that was a real personal fulfillment for them, but other characters survived to make it to a personal ending that was exactly explicitly designed for their, for their arc. And I think that left less of a sense of what this battle, what this fight against the Night King had really cost society in more general terms. So for me, particularly as someone who works on, on kinship and, and how family affects the identity um, of those involved in it, I, I thought it was a shame that the show ultimately abandoned those more complex identity models that were more kind of culturally and institutionally conditioned and just couldn't break out in the end of the individualistic paradigm. Um, and it actually reminds me a little bit of a, another TV show some of you may be familiar with um, called The Good Place which is a very different kind of fantasy TV show it's about a fantasy of the afterlife um, and it's really involved in the early seasons in this idea of what we owe to each other and the idea of self-improvement and, and sort of a kind of salvation through working together in community but then really interestingly in the finale to that series again all the series can offer is these relentlessly individualistic arcs and they really fell back on giving each of the five main sort of characters a perfect ending personally, but, but dissolving a sense of them as a group. So I think it's an interesting TV trope that, that is struggled with by writers sort of all across the board, really. Um, so I really regretted, yeah, that loss of institutional background. And for me personally, and I'd be interested to hear Laura's thoughts on this, given your research area as well, I really missed the idea of like the faith and institutional religion, because um, I found that least plausible about the show, as Caroline points out in the book, medieval men and women are really enmeshed in um, a kind of a, a faith and they went to mass every day and the rampant agnosticism of almost everybody in Westeros and Essos I found a little bit um, modern kind of intrusion into an otherwise quite believably rendered me medieval world. Um, so really there's few exceptions in the show. Um, there's a couple of people who have more of a, a faith, um, but most of them are either fanatics or charlatans. So we have the High Sparrow, um, Lancel Lannister, Melisandre, 
Um, and uh, those people that do have faith, so Davos's son has quite a lot of faith in, in season two, and he says to his father, you know, you weren't praying, but I was praying, and that's why you were always safe. Um, and he thinks that they're going to have victory because the Lord of Light is with them, and then I think five minutes later, he is blown up on screen. Um, and it just underscores, you know, faith is futile in this, in this world. And again, the strange quiescence, as Caroline puts it, of the people of King's Landing when their sept is blown up and there are no consequences to this um so i i i really found that um a curious um a curious thing to have nothing of in in a kind of medievalist fantasy and, and what that means for the show I, I think is interesting um because the faith in the end is just another institution that gets dismantled and that's kind of what i want to mainly reflect on is as Caroline said, the show dismantles an awful lot. Um, so you you dismantle maternity and paternity um, very effectively. Romantic love is heavily, uh, you know, problematized and dismantled. Although I think it's e interesting, and we, we might come back to this. A lot of the romantic um, relationships that are in the show and then dismantled are kind of added in from the books and are slightly changed mm -hmm. from their more ambivalent presentation in the book. So I found it interesting. They added in more romantic love purely to then dismantle it in front of us. Um, kingship is somewhat dismantled and only somewhat rehabilitated in the final episode. Um, and yeah, f even friendship is only ever very positive between men. Rewatching in preparation for this, I was really annoyed at how many women fall out over men or just cannot get along for unspecified reasons. Um, so as Caroline writes on page 109, although the old power hierarchies have been thoroughly critiqued, no viable alternatives have been mooted. So my kind of question for the panel a bit is, is what are we left with? And I think the reason I experienced the finale as hollow is because it kind of literally was hollow in a lot of senses. So much had been taken away, had been dismantled, had been hollowed out. What, what was the ultimate kind of message? And I suppose my take on that would be that, that what stayed with me is this question of what is life worth when all the rest is gone? And it's a question posed quite explicitly in the books by Miri Mazdur, mm -hmm. and it's continually explored in the show by all these different kinds of resurrection and survival. So you have Beric, Dondarrion, John, the mountain, all of whom die, come back to life, but it's a different kind of life. It's life as a burden and less of life as a, as a great experience. It's certainly not so much of a gift. Um, more extremely, we have the whites who have animation maybe, but not really life. And then a lot of people who decide that life isn't worth living anymore, the father and the daughter who kill themselves so as not to starve to death because the hound has robbed them, Tommen after the sept explodes, taking with it his wife, and, um, and the servants at the House of Black and White who must give up all selfhood in order to serve, the girl at the House of Black and White who's in so much pain that she just wants to die, Drogo, of course, who can't make that decision or isn't allowed to make that decision for himself. And it's Danny who decides his life is not worth living and, and kills him. And so I think the consistent answer that came out for me, rather depressingly, is that life is worth nothing when all the rest is gone. It's not enough just to live. And again, I thought this was quite a modern impulse, the, the emptying out of the sanctity of life. The idea that life is a possession, that it is your right to put down when you are weary of it. Um, and for me, that was more of a plea for social change to make life more worth living than an actual answer of any kind of social change that would do that. Um, so the writers, I think, I agree with Caroline, they couldn't in the end offer a framework for how that could look in societal terms. Um, all they could really do in the end is these narratives of individual personalized satisfaction. So yeah, it's great Tyrion becomes Hand, it's where he should be, he's fulfilled, it's the best use of his gifts. Um, and that's really wonderful, but as Caroline says, page 193, the future may indeed be better than the past and incorporate positive change. Change, however, that in conventional Hollywood terms is predicated on the life experience of the individual and not on social reform. Um, so yeah, that's my kind of question for the panel. What, what were we left with, <laughs> if anything? Yeah, we all feel incredibly dismantled at the end of Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the things I think I wanted to suggest was that with Epic in general, um, and with these huge stories, when you come to the end, there should be a kind of rebuilding. But there is always a kind of sadness as well. And you think of what's been lost and whether that's a kind of golden age myth that everything was fine until there was this intrusion of evil 
that disrupted paradise, let's say, if we were thinking about an epic like Paradise Lost. And then when we get to the end, we're in a, a different place, but it's never going to be quite the same. And I think it is quite important in some ways in the, the last episode to just take a moment to think about all of the people that we met along the way, all those people who have vanished. Um, but I think you're also right to suggest that what we have in that those final scenes, first of all in the Great Council and then in that last Small Council scene, are figures who we've become quite fond of. But in the Great Council scene, they've come up with a, a plan, oh, let's abolish hereditary monarchy, let's have an elective monarchy. Like that's going to solve any of the bickering <laughs> between the houses. I mean, it sounds like a recipe for every single, you know, every four years or every time a king dies, you're going to have a complete free-for-all and civil war just kind of written into the script. But notwithstanding that, that particular problem, that kind of matey, joshing business as usual, ending with, with Bronn and Tyrion and, and Davos around the, the table in the small council, to me, seemed to suggest that the status quo that was being re-established was a kind of business as usual blokes together. But there was Brienne. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the one kind of really encouraging moment there, I thought, along with Sansa, who we, we must come back to, her kind of Sansa's tribe, was Brienne just going, oh, boys, maybe we have other priorities than rebuilding the brothels. Maybe we should get some ships. And going off and writing Jamie's epitaph in the, the book of the, the gold cloaks as well. So I thought, in a way, you ended up with a, a sense that it was the women isolated as they are, with perhaps sacrificing any hope of personal happiness, who were going to take things forward, who were going to be able to build something new in the North mm -hmm. and to try to reform or perhaps to re-establish some kind of notion of, of what chivalry means back in the South. Because it's certainly one of the, the um, more interesting takes, if you like, on traditional medievalist fantasy that the show is so sceptical about chivalry. I mean, didn't you, you think that was kind of surprising that there are no good knights except for one who isn't a knight at all, who is, is Brienne? Yeah, and in the, in the early series that Sansa is so brainwashed by chivalry and by these notions of, of romance and good knights that she's completely in cloud cuckoo land. In terms and of what's what, really going... And the tournament going, oh, yeah. it's all so lovely. Oh, no. <laughs> He's just cut the horse's head off. Oh, yeah. And it's going to go downhill after that. And she, you know, she, she, uh, she realises that later mm. on. And she says, I think, I can't remember who she's, who she's talking to, but she says, if all the things... That happened to her hadn't have happened she'd have remained the little bird um who is completely just has no idea what's going on in the real i think it's the, the hound is it about water winterfell yeah. isn't it uh, just yeah, after it, the I victory it's feed it's yeah. yes and there's kind of yeah. apologizing and resetting going on in yeah. a lot of relationships yeah. because i think the hound slightly more explicitly in the books maybe is again a critique of that knight and maiden motif mm, yeah. and he says you know he makes her look at him and says, you know, I am a killer and your sons will be killers and your father is a killer. And, mm -hmm. and you know, the world is built by killers and that is all he thinks knights are. Knights yeah. are killers mm -hmm. that are then dressed up in, in fancier terms. Um, and that's why he refuses to be a knight because mm -hmm. his brother is a knight and he won't, mm -hmm. he won't partake in that kind of uh, devaluing of the institution, as it were. Yeah. yeah, and maybe the hound is a better kind of knight in a sense yeah. or a better kind of someone who sees chivalry more clearly for what it is. Yes. In um, this latest book here, the essay collection, Thomas Honegger talks about um, the hound as a cynic mm -hmm. and plays on the idea of the word cynic as actually deriving from the Greek word for kunos, meaning dog. And so there's, there's some lovely play going on there. And quite often you, you just wonder, does Martin know this yes. or does he just yeah. hit on this by kind of yeah. brilliance? But that cynical um, pose, no, not the pose, that cynical streak that runs through the hand is something which I think makes him yeah. um, a character who is much more complex than quite a lot of the others.
Yeah, I think that's I think that's right in his final interaction with Arya in King's mm. Landing, where he says to her, "You you have got to leave here." He's off to you know finally finally kill his brother. <laughs> I love the scene where they're fighting, and he's like, "Will you just?" die oh, you it. just die um and Ari is kind of i'm coming too because i'm gonna kill cersei i've got to i want to finish my list and he's like no you this revenge is is it will destroy you you have to leave and she thanks him and she calls him by his sandor, real name yeah, she says yeah. thank you sandor and, and then mm. leaves and that, i think that's a brilliant moment for him it's a great piece of writing at that point and it's the end of that arc isn't it and that kind of discussion of vengeance which goes all the way through the book, um, and particularly with Arya and her, her little list, or you know, by the end, quite an extensive list of, of people that she has to kind of tick off. And, and by the end, I think all of them are dead, except we're not too sure about Sir Ilan Payne, because he got written out of the, the series quite a long time ago. Um, and she's managed to polish off quite a few of those people herself. But the, the idea that you know, certainly working in medieval literature, as we all do, the way in which ideas of vengeance impel so many great medieval stories. And yet almost always, when you get to the end, there's also that hollowing out feeling, isn't there? You, when you get to the end of the Nibelungen lead, you yes. don't think, well, that's a job well done. You think, oh, look, look at the bodies piled up here, all the feuds in Beowulf. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, go, going back to, to Brienne, do you, do you think, because one of the things you talked about in the book is her, is these exceptional women who, you know, do they, do they offer a kind of exemplary paradigm or are they, you know, with Brienne and, and Arya, just these two women who, who are just very, very particular and individual. Um, I think Brienne is such an interesting character because of course there she, she is writing up Jamie's story in mm. the book. So to see a woman writing a narrative at the end is really powerful perhaps also compared to when um uh samwell brings in the book the kind of history of westeros and Tyrion says and how am i presented in it and he says oh well you're not you're actually not in it <laughs> which seems, seems such a kind of undercutting of how important Tyrion has been but somehow seeing brienne as this you know it's a kind of as a woman writer there's something quite powerful there that is interesting isn't it i think because women don't really get to tell their stories um, at any point, I don't think, except maybe Igrit a bit, when, but she's still not saying, this is what it was like when I was little, this is how I grew up, it's, this is what it's like to, to be a member of my people, this is how I represent the, the free folk from beyond the wall. And in a sense, I don't think we wanted to hear Arya sitting down with Sansa going, OK, well, since I left here, I've been doing all this really interesting stuff. We didn't need that recapitulation at that point. But at the same time, those stories do seem to be kind of sidelined a bit. Yeah, I mean, I think what it really underlined for me was that representation does not get you necessarily to a kind of equality or mm. um, so there was this point in the show I think about season seven and you had Danny on Dragonstone Sansa's kind of regent in the north Yara leads a, a large portion of Ironborn you've got Dawn run by Elaria and the Sand Snakes Olena is the only one left in Highgarden Cersei is in King's Landing and so across the board you've got great representation of, mm -hmm. of female leaders but then they hardly ever spoke to each other and they certainly never explored what it meant to really be a female leader and how that might be different from male leadership or so we get kind of one one conversation between Olena and Danny I think and, and one kind of between, fatal conversation yeah. in a way when she ends up yeah, saying you know, yeah I've seen all these men come and go there are sheep and there are dragons you need to be a dragon and that's such yeah. an incredible foreshadowing of the end yeah and you think, oh, Elena, you know better than that. Mm. You're wilier than that. Yeah. And so you don't need to, as it turns out, encourage Daenerys yeah. to be more violent, to be honest. No, and I think that was a, a bit of a missed opportunity that we couldn't see a little bit more um, discussion or exploration of a, a different kind of feminine paradigm somewhere. Um, yeah, in a way, I suppose you're in warfare and you've got this alliance yes. across, across the Seven Kingdoms of, of these women and you don't it's true you don't have a kind of council scene where all the women get together and go right now what's our strategy going to be which have been really interesting to to observe they are kept separate a lot of the time and one of the things that when I realized 
that the women were all in charge for a moment. I thought, ah, oh, now what's going to happen? But then it all goes wrong because um, the sand snakes are in the ship where they are, and then you start having this sex scene. And kind of, oh, right, the minute you take your eye off the board, well, women will get distracted by sex, even if it's sex between themselves, not sex with anybody else. And all of a sudden, Euron shows up and everybody's being captured or dead. So women are always being led astray by their bodies. I thought that was a pretty clumsy piece of writing. Mm. There's, the, there's the moment when, I really like the moment when Danny and Yara meet. Yeah. And mm. they, they, there's all the little kind of free song there. Yeah. Um, but, but when they, you know, they sort of agree to be allies and... Danny says, well, from now on, no more of this weaving, raping, rampaging around that the Ironborn do or some, something along those lines. And Yara says, you know, yes, absolutely, we, we, won't, we won't do those things. Uh, there's there's a, a kind of hope that that might be the case, but then you think, well, you know, she's going to go back to the, the Ironborn and are all those men there? We, I mean, we never see any other women of the Ironborn, do we really? No, I think there may be a couple the with kind of shorts judging islands, around yeah. in the villages, we, but none of them ever not, gets to open their mouths. Yeah, and we're, so we're not really sure mm. whether Yara agreeing Dan to, with Danny would yeah. actually lead to any kind of real and social And economically, change. what would be viable on the yeah. Iron Islands, you know? Yeah. What, what economically is there else to do with the Iron Islands? But the books are actually thinking quite interestingly yeah. about social change in the Iron Islands yeah. as being on the horizon. And as I've argued in a, an article in Tom Burkett and Rory Dale's book, what happened, what could happen to the Ironborn would be what happened to the Vikings, that they stopped raiding, they became merchants, they became traders, yeah. they were Christianized, they became literate. And they settled places. And they settled yeah. down. They settled in, in this country. They settled back into Scandinavia. They settled in France across the known world. Um, now, whether there's an ecological niche for the ironborn, given that the, it's the free cities who've got the, the real kind of stranglehold over trade in the narrow sea, whether they can grow a kind of shipping empire is something that's a bit difficult to imagine. But I like to think of that in the ironborn future, once Yara's got her no more reaving, raiding, raping, or the other thing. There are four of them, aren't there? Once that policy is in place. I just wonder whether we should move to questions or whether there, there are... I, I would I would quite like to ask you about religion. That was something. Yes, that, yeah, perhaps um, we should take you. up religion. Well, well yes, we'll, we'll have a few minutes on really religion. It, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I found it unsatisfying too that it seemed to to pop up at moments for almost supernatural or magical effect with someone mm. like Melisandre, you know, bringing random people back to life at helpful moments so they can do things that impact on the plot later. <laughs> um, you know, whereas when I first started reading the books, I felt that that mm. the faith of the seven was something that was quite important to the to the world. So I don't know what you mm. what you feel about the the way that religion gets sort of sidelined in the final. Well, I I think it is a sort of failure. It's partly Martin's failure, I think, because he builds he creates the religion of the seven and puts a lot of thinking into it, but he is himself a lapsed Catholic, mm -hmm. and so he and he says in interviews, I don't want to endorse any faith. So I'm moving everybody a step back from it. And exactly that kind of agnosticism that you were talking about, Kate, really informs the, the, the ways in which religion functions. And you have in, in the books particularly people popping up and saying, oh, I've seen everybody has their own gods. If there are so many possible gods, then none of them can be transcendent. But yet you do have the red god, you do have Rathlaw somehow, having this power and that made me a little bit uneasy i think once you start being able to resurrect people even when you've got very specific rules about how it can be done and i don't think either the books or the show are really explicit enough about the rules within this world which allow resurrection to take place but once you can start resurrecting people then suddenly death has no meaning mm -hmm. And what does Van Amogulis mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, the idea that you can, this person dies, oh, no, look, he's back again, is, is something which really eats into the fabric of tragedy and the fabric of epic as well. If you don't lose people, as, as you didn't lose people in the Battle of Winterfell, yeah. um, again, it, it's 
it's something we find in Tolkien, isn't it? The Battle of Helm's Deep. We yes. we lose one random Nobody elf guy, does. as I always <laughs> think of him, but um, everybody else comes through and um, you go, oh, okay, right. Well, that was a you know, sorry about that for all the humans and all the orcs that die, but at least all of our heroes are, are still here. So I, I think I think you're right that religion becomes magical mm -hmm. uh, in a way that the the showrunners in particular, who don't think a lot of things through by that stage, are just kind of right. Here is Melisandre at the Battle of Winterfell and she's doing a bit, oh look, and she's lighting things up and, and oh yes, yeah, she's got definite fire throwing capacities. But what else is she here for? And the, the logic of, I have to be here and now I will die. He was kind of, why? why? Yeah. <laughs> that was not clear at all. Yeah. <laughs> and was this whole thing actually because Bran claims that the great existential struggle or the transcendental struggle is between the three-eyed raven and the Night King and all the way through the centuries they've been locked in combat. Really? What, the old guy under the haunted forest? What was, what was he doing? Uh, but yeah, again, but then it looks actually like it was the, the Lord of Light was the one who was, who was at least not because Arya, for reasons that still think are a bit unsatisfactory is the one who killed the Night King. But these huge elemental oppositions of fire and ice seem to work better. But I also felt that maybe a dragon should have taken the Night King out. Yes. Definitely yeah. missed opportunity. I think. Yeah, I think we'd all like have liked yeah. more dragons yeah. <laughs> at, yes, that, at that point in the show. But it's this odd sidestepping of yeah. okay so it's not going to be Jon Snow who's going to mm. kill the Night King either and so mm. is he or is he not the prince who was promised yeah. and all yeah. of these prophecies that seem to have so why bother resurrecting him then yeah might as well just let, leave yeah. him on the slab um and people keep asking him how you know how how you know you've come back from the dead what does it mean yeah. and he's kind of don't know really yes. didn't didn't <laughs> I haven't really thought much about it didn't have much of an experience did while you not I was meet dead. your father um, did you not yeah, <laughs> see gibbering ghosts all saying I'd rather be alive Apparently did you not, not see so. Achilles you know that kind of thing right? yeah. yeah I mean I yeah. thought that was quite a nice um you know reversal of a, of a motif that you know you don't come back necessarily with the numinous knowledge that you might usually get from entering that underworld yeah. space but he didn't it didn't seem to have cost him anything either yeah. like there wasn't a sense you know, in the books, obviously, Lady Stoneheart comes back and yeah. you can really see what it's got done to her to go through death. And, and I yeah. thought, John, I, well, I sort of hope when he comes back in the books that, that he is different. You know, he has lost something and, and is yeah. a different kind of character to Because he's probably going to be dead for a little bit of time, I think, in the books. I'm not sure it's going to be that quick. But in the show, he just bounced back. He fell in love. Everything was, you know... I, I just think he bounces, sort of bounces, bounces on you know, the word <laughs> for John Snow. I think, I, my theory is he's always still a bit dead inside yeah. after yeah. that. Yeah. Dead inside already, um, so it made very little yeah. difference being yes, actually dead. Yeah. <laughs> or, or some sense of the weight of other people's faith in people. Because I think that would have been really helpful with Daenerys' mad turn, is to have had a character that was basically where we were, with faith in her as a, as a leader, maybe as the, the princess who was promised. Um, and then, then to see someone be disillusioned with her, whereas nobody was disillusioned. The North were already sceptical and were kind of like, oh, well, we didn't like her much to begin with. Mm -hmm. And her own people didn't seem to care when she took the mad turn, mm -hmm. you know, Grey Worm, seems to kind of follow through because he's also very well, he's loyal, he's striking about me and, yeah. and loyal. Mm -hmm. So nobody... And Tyrion and Varys already going, hmm. Yes, yeah, we're already so sceptical. Sure. So nobody mm. was quite where we also, were, Also, we I can think. sell John more plausibly yes. to the great houses. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I thought that was, given the amount of faith you presumably have in these leaders, to see some sense of people reckoning with that would have been, yeah. I think, mm. quite, quite interesting. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. I think maybe one... Thanks. Sorry, I was... Yes. Uh, so I was just wondering, like, one, one sort of final thing maybe before we move on, maybe just to talk about kind of dragons a little bit more explicitly <laughs> um, and kind of the dragons in the show and what the dragons meant for the show. Because I found it really interesting, Carolyn, what you said on page 32, where you say that they can't replace actual children and they can't perpetuate the Targaryen dynasty, although they are crucial to its restoration. Um, and kind of, you know, they are maybe not quite the selling point of Game of Thrones, but at least a key 
mm-hmm. a key aspect of its fantasy rendering. Like dragons are in almost every fantasy that you come across. Um, and I think the way George R. R. Martin did them was quite interesting because for me, he really took them seriously as this horrific, terrifying beast that is slightly uncontrollable and will almost inevitably end up doing something terrible because it's the nature of mm-hmm. the beast. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of the reasons maybe that was, again, tricky for us in the finale was that if you're used to the fantasy dragon that is wise and can be reasoned with and, mm-hmm. and has almost an ethical code about it, then it's a bit more surprising to see a dragon that I think for Martin was, and for the showrunners, was pretty animalistic at heart and that couldn't overcome you know, had no moral qualms whatsoever. You know, it is just, except maybe that Iron Throne, mm. Iron Throne question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's in- uh, interesting um, because, of course, Martin owes so much to Tolkien that he could have had the choice of having a dragon or a bunch of dragons that could talk. Yeah. And he decided not to go along that route. But at the same time, they have a kind of intelligence Mm. And Tyrion makes the point in the books because he's always been fascinated with dragons. He knows all about dragon lore and saying they're much smarter than dogs, which isn't a very high bar, it has to be said, in comparison with old Norse dragons, you know, who know the secrets of the dead and that kind of thing. But the, the dragons, and this is a kind of hook forward to House of the Dragon, of course, which is, is going to be enormously preoccupied with the destructive nature that the dragon has and the tactical advantage you have from having lots of dragons, small dragons, big dragons. And without spoiling House of the Dragon, um, there is a moment where the Matt Smith character is counting up how many dragons they've got on their side and how many dragons are on the other side and going, hmm, we need more dragons. <laughs> right, um, we better start <laughs> hatching a few more eggs yeah. out. Then that becomes a, a rather kind of strange uh, moment in the, the final episode there. So the, but the idea of the dragon as a tactical nuclear weapon, mm. which I mentioned in Winter is Coming, is something you have it, you shouldn't have to use it. Mm. And if you have to use it, then you're just using it to, as Daenerys does in Marine, you're having so much trouble with the the former slave masters, why not just bzz, torch yes. one yeah. and, that, and the others yeah. will fall into line. And that is kind of the beginning, I think, perhaps. And then it's the battle of the gold road and all of those troops are, are torched. And Daenerys says, yeah, well, had to do it. Um, and then you can see how that sort of escalates. Yeah, and because one thing, again, I thought the book kind of put in my mind that hadn't quite been there before was the idea of dragons as sort of inescapably colonial because they're always being used to build empire mm. so when when danny takes over marine it's maybe slightly clearer in the books um that marine has been subject to dragon rule before when it was part of the valyrian freehold yeah. so it's not just that she's a conqueror coming in and subjugating them it's the same conqueror coming in subjugating them with the same tool the top the dragon the back. Yes. um and um and that you know this is a kind of return to a colonial mm. rule um and, and then similarly in kind of Westeros, you know, the dragon is what she's going to build her conquest on. And whether there's something, I hadn't really realised just how, yeah, colonial, I suppose, a dragon was as a symbol. Yeah, there's yeah. a kind of Western technology, yeah. but yeah. It's, it's got a kind of strange mind of its own. Yeah, and that, as I say in the book, a kind of that classic colonising move of going, right, we're going to call Slaver's Bay something else, we'll call it the Bay of Dragons. Yes, why not? Because the dragons have replaced... Mm-hmm slavers as maybe the most terrible thing mm. that there is but we should we should turn we to the audience we should indeed get a word in so yes any any questions yeah i i think they're perhaps the exceptional characters who are put there in order to in a way um for the showrunners at least kind of if we have some representative small folk, we don't have to worry about the mass of them who are being set on fire by various queens at, at different points, or who are just being allowed to starve and Baelish there as well. You know, winter comes, more peasants die, pff, you know, that with few amounts to feed, that will be fine. So I think they, there's a kind of fantasy of, of social mobility there, but based actually on being really good at what they do as well. And, Davos ha- embodies a kind of 
extraordinary fidelity, first of all, to Stannis and then to um, Jon Snow as well. And he has, um, as well as that fidelity, he has the smuggler's knowledge of all the routes around the, the Narrow Seas, which doesn't turn out to be all that important in the end. But he has that kind of, of, kind of practical know-how that stands beside chivalry and knowing how to kill people is actually how to sail in a, in a way that's not going to drown everybody. And so there is a kind of reward for competence, I think, for Davos. It really, that's why he's there in, in the small council at the end. He's somebody who's competent. And Bronn has also had this meteoric social rise and has not changed morally, I don't think, in, <laughs> if indeed he ever had any morals, which would be a, a, a different question. But I think um, Bronn, in a way, kind of embodies the um, the enormous premium put on martial skills in that society, but stripped of the kind of romantic the romanticization as that line, um, a knight's just a sword with ribbons that Martin uses in the book. Um, you know, it may be looking very fancy, but it will kill you just instead. And Bronn has taken the ribbons off the sword and he kills people. He's a cell sword, is what he does, but he does it really, really well. And he has that kind of joshing relationship with Jamie in the show, which is a kind of light relief that we need at various points. Um, so I think Bronn has, is again a sort of example of a, a self-made man. Um, Gendry, of course, ends up with a, another kind of naught to zero, uh, no, sorry, naught to 60 shh, acceleration, but he's got royal blood. And that, I think, is, is always interesting in medieval romance, you know, as we know, the, the fair unknown who rises from being a humble blacksmith's apprentice to a king or a prince or a duke always turns out to have royal blood, except when he doesn't. And there are some really interesting exceptions to that. And so here, I think, in, in those two characters, we've, we're, because we're in King's Landing as well, and we're in a, a time of social turmoil, it's the end of the medieval period, the beginning of the early modern is coming in. And the kind of social mobility you could have in the 15th century is also playing out, I think, there, in, in the way that, um, that your your possessing land and possessing blood now no longer matters so much if you have royal favour and if you have money. Well, there's a lot that's really annoying, <laughs> as I think you chronicled there very nicely. A lot that's really annoying about the, um, the ways in which female sexuality is depicted kind of across the board. Um, and there's any amount of discussion about the ways that the show turns scenes which were of consensual sex and quite loving sex in the books into something which is much more rapey, it's got to be said. And um, particularly that scene which you didn't mention of Jamie and Cersei in The Great Set, which supposedly the actors said, oh, we thought it was consensual. It was just the way it was cut that made it look as if Cersei was not consenting. Um, and so that looked like a let's blame it all on the director move. And it turned out to be that that director didn't get to do any more directing after that season. So I, I think there's a kind of interesting politics of the show thing going on there. But I think what, what I did kind of welcome was the idea that women could express sexual desire and Daenerys, once she's got over the, if we can call it that, once she's fallen in love with, with Drogo in a way that she never really does for anybody else and takes back control of her own sexual pleasure there. After that, she sleeps with who she likes. And the fact she's sleeping with Darian Harris doesn't mean she has to marry him. And you know, he's not super happy when she's going to marry um, his dar, but he understands that... She has to do it for political purposes. And so I, I quite like the way in which women can, can say, I will do this, and people are not going to say, you're a slut. And in fact, in House of the Dragon, to, to go back to that, again, trying to avoid any kind of spoilers, that's very much what about virginity 
what about sexual shaming that is still very much part of, of life in King's Landing at that point. Um, which I, was, I think is interesting, given the Targaryens are always you know, marrying their sisters and so on. There are certain rules which you would think they could, they could suspend, but there's still patriarchy is obviously very much in control there. Um, as far as Arya is concerned, uh, I, don't know, I, I thought she was probably trying sex for, for one time to see what it was like and see if she could leave it behind as she sailed off to discover America. So um, it, it seemed not to me entirely out of place, but also um, not something that was going to change her life. And, and again, it was kind of dismantling that, oh, Arya and Gendry, are they going to get together? No, okay, right. There's no romantic, there's no big romantic ending there at all. And as for Jamie and Brienne, um, that was just tiresome, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact that they did get together or the, how he treated her afterwards and went off to Cersei. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it seemed like such kind of fan service to me, everybody mm. going, oh, will they, won't yeah. they, will they? And it's yeah. much better, yeah, as with all of these rom-coms, yeah. they always go completely downhill yeah. Yeah. once the two characters get yeah. together. And it'd be much better if, if they just kind of, you know, I don't know, hugged each other and gone, you've always meant so much to me, but yeah. I, you know, I have to go back to yeah. defend my sister yeah. without that kind of, oh, so we're together, Jamie. Yes. No, actually, I'm. I'm yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought that was that was something. If you had another season, you could have worked it out. But to, to have their whole relationship, you know, spanning less than an episode was, I thought, really irritating. It would have been better if they would just left it at the nighting scene, which I yeah, thought was quite that was moving. Perfect. That was yeah. a really. Yeah. That was a great moment, and it reminded me of. I think it's somewhere in season six when she meets him again. For the first time and she says i've got your i've got your sword and oh, she goes okay. to give it him yeah. back and he says no, no it's yours and it will always be yours and i thought that was really moving um but yes if they just if they kept it at jamie knighting brienne that would yeah because i think with all the disobliging things we've said about the the last seasons there were some great bits of writing yeah. and i think that eve yeah. of battle that kind of you know like the eve of agincourt and henry yeah. v going around Winterfell, watching everybody making their preparations for that final battle. I thought it was terrific writing in that. Yeah, this is such an interesting question, isn't it? Because when the show, I, I think he was under some kind of contract to say, whatever Benioff and Weiss do with the ending of the book, it's absolutely got my imprimatur on it, it's fine. And then when he saw the fan reaction, he started rowing back a bit and going, well, yeah, maybe, maybe we're going to kind of tweak things a bit. And then we're going from uh, tweaking things to, yeah, I think I'm going to just rewrite it the way I was always going to write it. So I think what's, what's going to be really interesting about that is, is um, it's actually a point Elizabeth Archibald, um, a medieval colleague, made to me. Um, was that what we often have in medieval texts is different recensions of something so it's not just a few variations that introduce into a story but here's one version of the story here's another version of the story that is completely different in some respects they're still the same characters still the same kind of general storyline and i think that's what we're going to end up with two recensions of the tale of what happened in king's landing in those years and i think that's that's going to be something that without going too far down the the kind of Marvel idea of we're, there are just lots of multiverses and anything can happen in any of them, which to me then means that nothing really matters very much because in another multiverse, this person isn't dead or they turned into a crocodile or, or something like that. Um, but I think having two recensions will be a really interesting problem for, or an interesting challenge, let's say, not a problem, for future writers to, about the, the whole Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire phenomenon, to think about how you weight the author's original vision as against somebody else's retelling. And in a sense, again, it's very medieval. It's the idea that you might think, here's an original, here are a lot of people who haven't really quite understood the main things and are writing it in their own weird ways. But actually, once the story is made, and once you've built that, that 
universe, that secondary world that Martin has done, then people are in a position to kind of go off with it and do different things with it. And so without going into a kind of multiverse theory, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the originator rebuilds his world after what happened in the show. Well, I was um, saying to Laura and Kate earlier that I've done some appearances at literary festivals, mostly um, with Winter is Coming, and talked to audiences who have sat there smiling very amiably and yeah. then saying, I, I've never seen this show, but actually you've made me think yes. I would really like well, to. That's what I thought. Yeah, and then I say that's 70 hours yeah. out of your life. And <laughs> at that point, anyone who's younger than 40 says, oh yeah, that's a weekend. And anyone who's older than 40 strokes their chin and thinks, yes, um, else to do. there are other things to do, possibly. But it has been a hugely interesting journey from the moment I first started watching the TV show before I read the books on a plane. Um, and just after 20 minutes of seeing the first episode, just go, yes, I'm in. This is a medieval world I believe in. And it's, it's done for fantasy literature what, what Tolkien did. It's as, yes, it's yes. as big as Tolkien, yeah. isn't it, really, yes. in terms of this? And I think, yeah, I think we will, it will be yes. a, a Tolkienian in its, yeah. in its lasting yeah, it's importance, I think. Mm -hmm. um, both just as Peter Jackson's films of Lord of the Rings have become part of the canon, so the show and the books are yeah. going to be working together, particularly with, with more shows. House of the Dragon's been recommissioned. It's been a howling success. Yeah. So this is a world that's only going to get bigger. Mm -hmm. well, that's why it's weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I was also just going to say, I think it's opened up fantasy more generally as well. Yeah. You know, you think shows like The Witcher and... Um, Oh, the, there's a new Tolkien one on Amazon as well. Rings, Rings of, of Power. Rings of Power. And, and I, I think it has brought that into the mainstream in a way that it wasn't, obviously, prior. Mm. Um, yeah, a lot of that has to do with the, the hunger for content that the streaming yeah, uh, services have, that Netflix and Amazon and, yeah. and Disney are all looking around going, where's the next Game of Thrones? Where can we get it? Is it this? Is it that? Mm. Um, and so in some ways... The, fantasy fills that particular gap but at the same time you've really got to commit because it's expensive yeah. and you can see in over the course of Game of Thrones what happens when you have six million dollars per episode budget in the first season and you have about 15 men and a dog riding through the northern Irish countryside looking incredibly miserable and that's the, <laughs> the Dothraki hordes and then by season six, you've got $15 million per episode, and you've got CGI everything going on. And, and the Dothraki all look much happier because they're yeah. extras in, in Morocco, and it's much, much warmer. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to be sure about your, your product before you commit to it. But if you do get something like Game of Thrones, the money it's made has been absolutely phenomenal. And do you think, because with Rings of Power, obviously a lot of actors of colour in it, and it makes me wonder whether without Game of Thrones, perhaps the new Rings of Power might have been cast in a slightly different way, that there's maybe a kind of response to some of the opening up that Game of Thrones has done? I think that's probably true, because I think that it really was, um, with all the criticisms around the Orientalism and, and the fact that it, um, actors of colour only got minor roles, and very much shaded on on whether they were more Mediterranean looking as opposed to you know almost no black characters yeah, except for you know, Salador San I guess. Um, I think I think that did kind of lever open mm -hmm. the questions around multiracial casting, which were happening anyway, which yeah, yeah. happening in the RSC, happening mm -hmm. across the board. And I'm not quite sure with House of Dragon making a branch of the Targaryens, all of them are black. Yeah. And they have these, you know, this Targaryen hair. But, and I kind of wonder whether House of the Dragon thinks, right, we've got a whole black family here. Is that enough? Mm. Um, there's there's still so more there's to be a bit done more to be done, but I think sure. it, it's stuck in a very small part of the, the known world, in a sense, in House of the Dragon. I think once that starts opening up a bit more, then we will see a very much more inclusive vision going on there. 
well. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and thank you very much to Caroline for writing such a, well, two fantastic books and all the uh, essay collections and books that are to follow. So well, thank, thank you. Thank you for everybody. being such a great um, panel and thank, and you, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you.